follow-up presentation from the presentation that I did last year. And one of the reasons why arboviruses are kind of like very fascinating for me is because it hits uh, close to home. So if uh, by any midway through the presentation do you guys have something to add or any questions, please feel free to do so. Okay, so the first thing is uh, what is an arbovirus? An arbovirus is a term used to refer to a group of viruses that are essentially transmitted by arthropods. Um, usually the symptoms tend to happen for most of them between 3 to 15 days after they get exposed to it and the symptoms tend to last 3 to 4 days. Of course there is variation and there is other complications individually. Um, the most common clinical features are going to be fever, headaches, malaise, which are very non-specific, and you also tend to have other um, symptoms just like encephalitis or hemorrhagic fever like in dengue. Um, the connection between the arthropods and the disease was not postulated until 1881 when a Cuban doctor and scientist Carlos Finlay essentially proposed that yellow fever might be transmitted by mosquitoes and not by human-to-human -human contact. And this was verified later on by Major Walter Reed in 1901. So we all know that one of the primary vectors is the Aedes aegypti. We keep hearing about this mosquito on and off. Um, it's actually one of the main vectors for dengue, chikungunya, and now Zika. Um, and we also know that essentially um, it, this mosquito has spread globally from the 15th to the 19th centuries because of the result of globalization and it caused dengue fever epidemics during that time. Another vector that we're going to be talking is the Colex population um, and also uh, we, you know, we came to find the discovery of West Nile virus came in 1937 and you know based on the codex. So we have two major important vectors that are currently, at least we've been talking a lot uh, about them recently on. And this is the Canum, the Panal, Canal of Panama, uh, which we recently, Robin and I had the opportunity to go to. And a little bit of the history is that the construction got stopped because people were dying of yellow fever and malaria. And, you know, the French were the ones that started doing the construction and because of the amount of people dying, they decided to just leave the project. Then the Americans came by and they essentially were the ones that completed the construction. And what they did is essentially they found a way of um, killing the mosquitoes that were transmitting the disease. Um, essentially, they had a prior success in Florida and Havana uh, by reducing the mosquito population, just doing what we do right now, decreasing the amount of water in places that they can, the mosquitoes can breed, also like cutting the grass and other stuff, which is what we currently do, trying to control the mosquito population. And with this, they were able to eradicate the cases of yellow fever, and they were able to complete the construction of the canal. And, you know, this is uh, the success that they had is the one that we actually implement nowadays on how to prevent mosquito bites. So the Arbovirus, the classification, we have four major groups. The Bonioviridae, uh, we have the California encephalitis virus based in this family. Um, the Flaviviridae, which is the one that we're going to be talking more often, especially during this presentation. And this is where we have our Dengue, our Suto, and our Zika. Um, we have the Rioviridae, and sad, lastly, the family Togaviridae, which is where I'm going to be discussing a little bit if we have time, Chikungunya, and Mayaro. So, the Aedes species, as we know, the, um, is one of the main vectors, especially for the Flaviviridae and the Togaviridae. And, you know, first we started with Dengue fever, which, you know, is very common here also in Florida. Um, then we had the Chikungunya, the last one was Zika, and then what could be coming next to our area? Uh, well, we were in Panama, or well, when I was in Panama, they mentioned something about Mayaro and Suto. Um, so we'll try to see if we can discuss them very briefly. So the 
the cycle is essentially the virus is going to attach, it's going to disassemble and fuse, it's going to start the translation, replicate, and then it's going to come out of the cell, and that's how essentially it replicates. And Zika, we all know that is an arthropod, flabby virus, essentially um, is an RNA, and it came, um, you know, after the one, the forest in 1947. It's not a new virus. It's been present for a long time. But, you know, given the recent um, effects with microcephaly and Guillain-Barre, that's why it was very well known in our area. The geographic distribution is essentially, um, you know, has been found in a lot of places in Africa and now in the Americas as well. Um, essentially, it started in Africa and then it spread to Southeast Asia, where it was associated with some sporadic infections. Then the major outbreak was in the Jap Islands in 2007. And then essentially more than 70% of the population more than three years of age was infected. And then the question is why we have this major outbreak. It was not on the news, why it didn't happen. So we can go back a little bit later to find out what is the main difference between that outbreak and ours. So essentially, it happened in the Western Hemisphere in 2014, February, approximately two, three years ago. Um, basically, it continued to be detected there until June 2014. And of course, we have the major Zika outbreak in Brazil, and where the association with Zika and microcephaly was established, and that's when it actually became a worldwide um, concern. So by February of last year, it's been last year, so we have all these countries that were associated with Zika, and we keep adding more and more, and we have a lettered site that essentially established, you know, how is everything in all the Americas. Um, this is a picture of a baby with microcephaly, and, um, you know, has been detected in the U.S. territories, the United States, the U.S. Virgin Island, and the first case, we cannot forget that that it was uh, related to congenital microcephaly happened in Hawaii in January 2016. And it was a, a pregnant woman who essentially, you know, lived in Brazil during some time during her pregnancy. Also, we cannot forget Texas, which is where our first case of an infection reported through sexual transmission was reported in Texas. And that basically, you know, brought us to think if it is, you know, if it's transmittable by sexual transmission, what else or where else we can find this virus. This is a little bit of a map. Uh, so we keep in mind it's not a new virus happening in 1947 in Uganda. It had some sporadic outbreaks there. Then we have the Malaysia, Pakistan, and Indonesia outbreaks. Then 2007 Jap. Then the French Polynesia. And last, the Brazil and now back to our area. So as of February 15 of 2017, a few days ago, the Zika virus uh, and congenital infections are national reportable diseases. So if you suspect of a case of somebody having Zika or being um, actually diagnosed with Zika, we need to notify that. So far, by February 15, we have 5,000 cases of Zika virus disease diagnosed in the U.S. 4,000 of them were essentially from travelers coming from areas where it was an um, ongoing uh, outbreak. Now, if we go back where these cases are more common, of course, we are number one, Florida, with 220 cases, and Texas has six. So, so far, we know of 220 cases that were presumed to be locally at cases uh, that were transmitted here in the U.S. Um, of course, of these cases, 72 were thought to be admitted, including sexual transmission, at least 44. Congenital infection, at least 26 cases. Um, lab transmission and person-to-person -person without any known route as of now, one of each. Also, if we take into account the U.S. territory, where Puerto Rico, encounter, we have at least 37,000 cases reported. 141 are essentially from travelers from affected areas. Now, this is a very important statistic. 36,000 of them are presumed to be through mosquito borne. They don't do the sexual transmission because it's very difficult to do so 
in a very small area like for example Puerto Rico is like 135 miles and it's very difficult to establish whether this is mosquito borne versus sexually transmitted so essentially they don't count the, tra the sexually transmitted sigma so some of the statistics about how this affect our pregnant patients. Um, so far as of February 7, according to the CDC, in the United States and the District of Columbia, there's been uh, 1,400 cases. And in the US territories, we have 3,000 cases. Of this, completed pregnancies with or without birth defects, 1,000. We had 43 live-born infants with birth defects, and we have five pregnancy losses during these cases. So these essentially tell us that, yes, there is a very strong association with Zika and problems with pregnancy, which we didn't get to see in the prior outbreaks. This is a map of the US and how many cases they've been diagnosed, either be traveler, sexual transmitted diseases, or locally acquired. And of course, we can see that the main ones are essentially Florida, Texas, California. So what's going on with Florida? So we have a little bit of a distribution of where the cases have been found. And we have Wynwood. Um, the sun was lifted in September 19. North Miami Beach, Little River, South Miami, and of course, you know, not so long ago, the CDC designated um, the Miami-Dade area as a cautionary area. They had to actually go to the area, make sure that the area was clean and, you know, the mosquitoes were taken care of. Last confirmed case of local transmission Zika in Miami-Dade was reported in December 21, 2016. And so far, we haven't had any new cases. But if you know about something, please let me know. So um, as we have discussed, the Zika virus transmit, is transmitted essentially by the bite of the Aedes mosquito. But we cannot forget that it can get transmitted via blood, via semen, um, saliva, the CSF, and you know, it's even possible via breast milk. We haven't had any reporter cases transmitted via breast milk, but um, they have found um, Zika in breast milk. Um, you know, as we all know, Aedes essentially lives in tropical regions, but we have Aedes albopictus, which tends to be a little bit more in the temperate regions, and is also cap capable of carrying Zika as well as other flaviviruses. Um, and, you know, they tend to bite during the daytime as well as twilight, and we can forget about the stranding water. And this is a little bit of a depiction, so, you know, for those that better understand pictures, um, you know, the area of the upper part, the upper picture is essentially the Aedes aegypti distribution, and we tend to see that it's warmer areas. And in the bottom, we have the Aedes albopictus, which tend to be a little bit more temperate. So essentially, any of those areas are possibly areas that we can get um, any like flavivirus outbreak. Um, as we know, trans, uh, maternal fetal transmission can result in congenital infection. We haven't been observed breastfeeding as a potential source for the baby getting it, but we have found um, evidence of Zika there. Um, we know that it can be sexually transmitted even if the person is not having any symptoms uh, because we know that 80% of the patients actually do not have any symptoms associated with Zika. And we know that in semen, the virus can last for a longer period of time, at least a reported case of 62, and there are some other studies that it can even last longer. Um, it's actually recommended uh, to abstain from any kind of sexual activity in six months for those that actually go to any endemic area or think that might have gotten infected. And we know that it's present in blood, so it can be transmissible via blood products. So what does the CDC says? So essentially all pregnant women with sex partners who lived in or traveled to an area with Zika, they need to use some kind of barrier protection like condoms uh, for the rest of the pregnancy. And um, if any of the patients for they test positive, they need to reported um, and you know they need to make sure that 
they are aware of it even if the corner never got sick or never developed any symptoms. The latest changes according to the CDC is that even men with possible Zika virus exposure regardless of whether they have symptoms or not, they need to wait at least six months if they develop symptoms or from the last possible exposure before they need to have any kind of sexual relations without protection with their partners given that there is a very high risk that they can you know transmit it to the sexual partners um, you know regarding the signs and symptoms 80% of the patients tend to not have any symptoms one in five might develop the symptoms and usually tends to be very mild to moderate um, it can start with a low-grade fever, maculopapular rash, arthralgias, um, especially in the small joints of hands and feet, conjunctivitis, and I'll show you guys a picture of a patient that I saw in Panama. Um, and you know, we can have uh, a clinical is at least we have two or more of these symptoms. Other commonly reported manifestations, uh, you know, the headache, the retroorbital pain, but it can also like rarely present with abdominal pain, nausea, diarrhea. Um, you know, there's been some questionable history of pericarditis associated with Zika um, and, you know, epididymitis, some mouth sores. So there's still some ongoing investigation about whether there can be some other manifestations of Zika besides the ones that we already know. The incubation period is just a few days, usually it tends to happen 2 to 12 days after the mosquito bites. So symptoms, fever, rash, joint pain, conjunctivitis, you have the person infected that can transmit it to the mother, then you know the mosquito can bite you and can keep on spreading the love of Zika to others. So usually if it's a mild disease, it tends to resolve within days. Um, keep in mind that the, that the Zika might be detectable for a few days, weeks, or even longer if it's the salmon. Um, and, you know, sometimes severe disease requiring hospitalization is still very uncommon. I still haven't found a case um, that somebody required admission due to Zika. And, you know, we know about the pregnant patients and the complications, but nothing about somebody requiring admission otherwise. Um, and, you know, we have the congenital microcephaly, the fetal losses, and Guillain-Barre. How do we diagnose? Mostly through reverse transcriptase PCR um, for Zika viral RNA or Zika virus serology. We can also do the IgM antibody or this Zika virus 90% plaque. Um, it usually tends to, it needs to be higher compared to other flaviviruses if we do this last test. Um, for individuals within the first to seven days, usually we do the reverse transcriptase PCR in serum for detection. It's only positive for a brief uh, period of window, like three to seven days. Uh, so a negative result is not gonna exclude the infection. Um, and you know, we should also test for dengue or chikungunya. What we were doing in Panama is, you know, if we have a patient that presented with suspected Zika and it was outside or it was in between that window period, they would take samples from the urine, from the blood, and from the saliva. Um, for individual four or more days after the onset of symptoms, then, you know, usually we would do like IgM, serology, and again, we would compare it with other flaviviruses, make sure that there was an increase at least fourfold. Um, you know, and if there were more than that, you know, we would try to do all the tests available. There is no treatment, and we still don't have treatment for Zika. Usually it's um, symptomatic management. Um, so, and of course, the prevention of mosquito bites and doing supportive care more than anything. Now, regarding the pain, if you have a patient that complains of arthralgias, we have to keep in mind that before they take, um, aspirin, you know, we need to make sure that they don't have other conditions like dengue. So what can we expect? So I think uh, the next thing that we can expect for Zika is essentially, you know, if there is any way that we can prevent it, right? Um, I think Sushi, when she went to the IDSA, they um, focused a lot about, you know, the vaccine and the creation of a vaccine and who can benefit from that. So essentially, if we create a vaccine, this vaccine needs to be safe to be given in pregnancy. Um, if it's something that, you know, if it's 
like a life attenuated vaccine, whether this can cross the placenta and affect the baby, what are the long-term consequences, um, and whether or not this can create some kind of um, immunity against other flaviviruses. So there's still some ongoing questions um, regarding about what we can do regarding a vaccine. Also, if we can, there is a way that we can help reduce the viral load to help reduce the transmission and any complications. And, you know, if it's a pregnant patient, which is our population that we're targeting the treatment, to keep in mind that it needs to be safe for the fetus. Um, and of course, you know, the best way to prevent is to prevent the mosquito bites. Um, so, you know, we have to avoid the mosquito bites and there is like personal protective measures like wearing long sleeve, using repellents. Um, sometimes it's difficult, like if you live in Puerto Rico, we don't have AC in every house. So it's very difficult for people that live there to tell like, hey, stay indoor with the AC when we don't have AC. So it depends on the area. Um, but, you know, essentially is there is ways to avoid the mosquito bites, which is the best way to prevent uh, the Zika virus infection. Environmental control measures is going to include the identification and elimination, uh, the mosquito larva breeding standing water, and of course domestic water tanks should be covered so that the mosquitoes cannot enter and replicate. Another picture so that we have a little bit for those that are visual about the Zika, the symptoms, where is it, and the mosquito Aedes aegypti. So microcephaly, this is one of the main issues and this is what happened essentially in Brazil and that's what it brought attention worldwide. It's essentially that pregnant women most likely in the first trimester are at increased risk of fetal loss. Um, a number of uh, essentially authorities said that if you're pregnant, try to avoid those areas. Um, and you know, everything started happening when we noticed that a large number of pregnant patients in Brazil, their babies were having microcephaly at birth. And this was an ongoing and it was very parallel to the ongoing Zika outbreak. So between March 2015 and March 2000, February 2016, at least 4,000 were diagnosed with microcephaly in Brazil. Um, and, you know, if we go back, so what happened with the other prior outbreaks? There was no birth defects reported in the outbreak in the Jap Islands in 2007. So one of the questions is like, what is different between this outbreak in Brazil and the outbreak in Jap? So some of the um, hypotheses is maybe they had like a small population, maybe other factors were taken into account. Um, so we still don't know what is the difference between one outbreak and the other. Um, no fetal anomalies were identified initially in the French Polynesia outbreak in 2013 and 2014, but then they decided to do a retrospective evaluation, and they found that there were 17 cases associated with some kind of nervous system malformation. So um, we did find something in one of the outbreaks that happened before the Brazil one. Um, the spectrum of outcomes associated with the infection during pregnancy is not completely understood with this is an ongoing experiment. So it's not only about seeing the microcephaly or the nervous system abnormalities that happen with this baby. It's like, let's say that you have a pregnant patient who baby didn't have any microcephaly, was completely healthy. Are we going to be able to see any long-term sequela? especially in the nervous system because it tends to have a very strong association between the Zika virus and the nervous system. Um, so um, usually uh, the Zika virus RNA has been detected in pathologic specimens, especially during the first trimester. And you know, there hasn't been a very um, like establishment that it says Zika can cause fetal losses. But we have encountered recently some kind of association with possibly fetal losses associated with Zika. Uh, there is no evidence uh, to suggest that pregnant women are more susceptible to Zika or that they experience a more severe disease. So even if a pregnant patient has Zika, it might be mild to moderate, the more damage is essentially to the fetus. Um, the greatest risk is small formations uh, of microcephaly and these tend to be more pronounced if they get infected during the first trimester of pregnancy. 
uh, the rate of vertical transmission is still unknown and uh, basically we haven't found anything because it's still too early we're still gonna be monitoring those babies of those mothers who essentially were infected with sick in uh, the fetuses we got like 35 Brazilian infants with microcephaly were found during ultrasound and they included brain calcifications especially in the periventricular parenchymal and thalamic areas um, and when we have two Brazilian infants with microcephaly that were born at 36 and 38 weeks died within 20 hours of birth we also had two fetal losses and all of them had Zika viral DNA in the in the brain tissues not in other places though which you know basically tells us that there is a high affinity with the nervous system um, a report described a fecal autopsy um, again um, of a patient who decided to terminate her pregnancy um, demonstrated fetal microcephaly and intracranial calcifications so even if in the beginning you have a pregnant patient who is infected with Zika and doesn't have any evidence of microcephaly, we need to repeat the ultrasound because later on it might be evident. Um, and like I said, it was diagnosed in the brain tissue by reverse transcriptase PCR. Also, we have seen ocular involvement, especially among these infants uh, that were born with congenital infections, including macular atrophy and optic nerve abnormalities. Again, very affinity for the nervous system. So if we have a pregnant patient, what do we do? If we think that she had any kind of sexual encounter with somebody who was in the area was infected, you know, basically you have to say whether or not there was any clinical illness. So you can do an ultrasound. If there is no findings, we have to repeat it later on just to ensure. If there was any evidence of clinical illness, then we have to test the patient for Zika. And we're still going to do an ultrasound because we need to make sure whether or not the fetus was affected. So according to the CDC, uh, you know, we have very high affinity with Zika and neurological diseases. So the frequency is unknown, but we know that at least one in 5,000 infections are associated with Guillain-Barre. There is increased evidence uh, of this strong association with Zika and Guillain-Barre. Doesn't mean that if you get Zika, you're going to get Guillain-Barre. But, you know, if you have Zika and then you develop Guillain-Barre, there is an association between those two. Um, several uh, countries actually experienced an outbreak in Zika and Guillain-Barre, making that association plausible. And, uh, you know, the CDC suggests that it's very strongly associated, but only a small portion will actually get the infection of Guillain-Barre. And, you know, the CDC is still ongoing with investigations regarding this topic. Other syndromes, encephalitis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, anterior myelitis, ocular abnormalities. Several countries, not only the U.S., have seen this association between Guillain-Barre. And if we go back to the prior outbreaks in the French Polynesia, essentially they found that 74 patients presented with some kind of neurologic or autoimmune syndrome after they were diagnosed with Zika. So, and from this, 74, 42 were classified as Guillain-Barre, making this association also stronger. Um, of course, we have the case of a Zika virus persistent uh, that presented for the first time in Texas. And, you know, there's been ongoing and multiple more cases about sexually transmitted Zika diseases. Um, don't forget that it's present in blood. So usually if you, one of your patients um, is planning on giving a blood transfusion and they were in one of these areas that there is an ongoing outbreak, we usually tell them that they need to refrain at least for a month. Um, but if they're not sure, you know, um, and they give blood and then later on they find out they have 14 days to report that. Um, so current recommendations for the CDC to date, so far, as far as I know, and if you do, please let me know, they haven't found any cases of transfusion-related Zika. Um, but there has been a case of Zika transmitted by platelets in Brazil. The Red Cross is what I told you that, you know, they really want you to wait at least 28 days before you give blood. 
the FDA broadened that deferral to include anybody who has symptoms of Zika in the prior four weeks or anyone who had sexual contact with a person who has traveled or lived in an area with active Zika transmission in three months prior. And the CDC just stated that there is no FDA license test for Zika, uh, but testing uh, did became available through two separate investigational new drug applications for blood, especially the ones collected in Puerto Rico and mainland US. And these tests became available in April 3rd and June 20 of 2016. And once uh, they do a blood testing and they find that the blood is positive for Zika, that blood get uh, removed from the blood supply. Um, so there is no routine policy for Dorgans. So that's still an ongoing topic. Um, I don't think this has changed much from the presentation that I did last year. Um, it can be transmitted. If it's in the blood, it can essentially be transmitted via organs. Um, so basically what they do is you know, they, they screen the donors from affected outbreak areas, especially if there is a risk that they got infected between 10 to 14 days. There is also a, like a screening questionnaire that they have to fill out. Um, and at the end of the day, we don't know whether, you know, this organ, how it's gonna affect um, with the relationship with Zika if the patients get it. And it's our decision and the patient's decision whether or not, you know, we have to put in a balance, right? Whether if they actually need it, uh, we'd seek an uh, ongoing outbreak. So vaccines, again, uh, the consideration for Zika vaccine, and I think I already discussed this before the slide. So essentially, when can we create another vaccine or create the vaccine for Zika? And who is going to benefit? Of course, our pregnant patients and their partners. Um, you know, anybody who is traveling to any area that is endemic might benefit. Just like we vaccinate people from yellow fever, this can become an ongoing thing. And of course, the commercial sex workers in these areas. Um, so, what's going on so far in the world with Zika? So, situation uh, in the Americas. So, since Epidemiological Week, no additional countries or territories have confirmed autochthonal spectrum transmission of Zika disease. So far, 48 countries and territories in the Americas have confirmed uh, vector-borne transmission of Zika since 2015. Five countries in the Americas have reported sexually transmitted Zika. So, if we separate this, in the U.S., the Florida Department of Health continues to report isolated local transmission cases, and we have Mexico, who essentially has been having a decreasing trend with a weekly average of nine confirmed cases in the last four weeks. In Central America, the cases remain very constant. So far, 369 cases, 317 suspected, 52 confirmed in the last four weeks. And in Panama, we have had a growing trend and suspected and confirmed cases uh, up until the first week of, uh, of January 2017. In the Caribbean, we have Montserrat has been having an increased trend in between the suspected and confirmed cases, while other territories in the Caribbean essentially has remained very stable in the confirmation of Zika. So at least we have come to kind of like a plateau. And in South America, um, we still have a very stable uh, confirmation of suspected cases. Um, so far, we have 6,000 reported in Brazil in the last four weeks. Paraguay um, has been having a very, uh, an increase lately. Peru, so far, uh, there's been an increase in the numbers, especially up until the third week of January 2017. Um, and there is an increase, uh, they think that this is uh, related to an outbreak that occurred in Loveto. And we also have been seeing in uh, Venezuela increased uh, of Zika. So this is a patient that I saw back in Panama. He is a 
eight-year-old gentleman, no medical history. He tends to live near the jungle area, I guess I could say. Um, essentially comes to us because he's been having this rash. Increased, very itchy, and he's been having some conjunctivitis, arthralgias, swollen. So I was very excited because that was the first case of Zika that I actually got to see. So, so let you guys have an idea. Sorry, I think the rash didn't show, but it was very interesting to see that. We also um, saw a female with a very similar rash, but it was a little bit more later on. And uh, in her case, um, the rash was not the thing that was bothering her. It was mostly the, the severe arthralgias that she was having. For her, um, you know, we were not completely sure, so we also tested, you know, every single patient that comes um, for a rule out Zika gets tested for dengue and chikungunya as well. So, um, I keep saying Zika, but we can't forget about chikungunya or dengue. Um, usually the incubation period is very similar between all three of them, between 2 to 14 days. Uh, most of them tend to have fevers. Zika tends to have a low grade and more higher fevers in dengue and chikungunya. Um, all three of them can have rash. All three of them can have some kind of other manifestations like fatigue and muscle pains and rash. Now, chikungunya tends to be very... Um, I know that they said dengue is a breakbone fever, but chikungunya, the manifestation musculoskeletal with the pain and the extreme arthralgias tend to be more pronounced, more prolonged, and more severe. At least every single family member that had it in my family complained of that. So a little bit to distinguish between the three of them, um, we can see leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, mostly in dengue and chikungunya, um, heparomegaly, again, dengue and chikungunya, all of them can have lymphadenopathy, fever, myalgias, retroorbital pain, and rash. But now, with Zika, we tend to be more associated with edema and conjunctivitis. So, I think I have some time. Um, I'll go briefly. Dengue, again, is transmitted by the Aedes aegypti, and it can also be with Aedes albopictus. It's usually an infection that can be asymptomatic, but it can be so severe that it can present with hemorrhagic or severe shock. There is four types, and there is transient cross protection between the types, but it's, you know, once that protection is gone, um, it's said that if you get infected by another one, it can be more severe. And uh, essentially, this, the breakbone fever is going to be non-specific symptoms like fe fever, headache, retroorbital pain, myalgias, rash, and you can have the hemorrhagic uh, manifestations. When we are talking about dengue hemorrhagic fever, we're talking about the plasma leakage, and this is going to be more associated with intense abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, thrombocytopenia, um, and you know we're going to have the petechias, the ecchymosis, people can have bleeding from the mucosa, some of them can have hematemesis, um, so these tend to be a more of an, um, a severe picture. And then we have the positive tourniquet test that we do. The diagnosis of dengue is mostly clinical because sometimes, you know, it takes a little bit of time, so it's very important that you know how to identify that. We usually put a blood pressure cuff, we inflate, and we should be able to see the manifestations in the, in the arm which is going to be petechias, at least 20, at least 2.5 centimeters. So, and we have the dengue shock, which essentially tends to happen associated with that rapid and weak pulse. And, you know, you're going to have the cold, clammy extremities. So some of the warning signs and some of the not so warning signs is, you know, in the first part, you're going to have the nausea, the vomiting, all typical symptoms associated with dengue. And when the patient starts complaining of something more like fluid edema, uh, sorry, edema or um, hemorrhagic um, or abdominal pain, so we have to think about more of something associated with hemorrhagic shock or severe um, dengue. So again, we're also going to be seeing an elevated AST and ALT. Sometimes people can present with altered consciousness, organ failure, and you know, this severe plasma leakage is going to go with shock and 
fluid accumulation causes respiratory distress. Um, of course, we have the rush that is not going to be is going to be present. Um, you know, it can have facial fluffiness, can have bruising, and like I said, the incubation is going to be between three to fourteen days. So we should suspect this um, in areas if somebody went to a typical area of dengue or if they're having any of the typical manifestations. The diagnosis is mostly clinical, uh, but we can also do, you know, laboratory diagnostic confirmation. The problem is sometimes these results might take a longer time, so we have to keep that in mind. So usually we do the viral components in serum, and usually we do the viral nucleic acid, which tends to have a very high specificity, but is very costly. Serology has a lower specificity, but is more accessible and less costly. Um, so usually during the first week of uh, illness, we can have the detection via the nucleic acid, and you know we can also use a reverse transcriptase assay. And there is also the non-structural protein, NS1, which tends to be positive in the first seven days of illness. We can also do IgM, which is uh, detected as early as four days after the onset of illness. Uh, the likelihood of IgG is going to depend on whether this infection is primary or secondary. So, you know, there is always some cross-reactivity if it's secondary. Um, the diagnosis might be co-founded, meaning that if you got a vaccine with yellow fever, it's a flabby virus, so it might be some cross-reaction if you do the titers. And, of course, you know, we can also do the cultures to detect the dengue virus um, and some, you know, immunohistochemical staining. The other one that I wanted to touch that I think we should not forget, because for me all three of them are very closely associated, is the chikungunya, which is again um, associated with the Aedes aegypti, and it usually tends to have an acute febrile polyarthralgia and arthritis. Usually it comes from the African language that means bends up or stoop walk. And the reason is because it's such a severe incapacitating arthritis that a patient can barely walk. Um, usually the outbreaks of chikungunya have occurred in Africa, Asia, Europe, and recently in the Americas, and tends to happen mostly in tropical rainy season. Um, because that the vectors Aedes aegypti and Aedes apopictus, um, chikungunya was initially perceived to be on the end virus that would happen in the tropical areas, but um, we're going to find out later that it actually happened in Italy back in 2007, which is not very typical for that. Um, the first locally acquired cases of chikungunya in the Americas was reported in 2013 on the islands of the Caribbean, and he's, since then has been spread. So, And the, the first cases of local transmission in the continental U.S. was reported here in Florida back in 2014 um, and you know of course we have Puerto Rico which has been locally transmitted a long time ago and you know there's been also like 25% of blood donors have been found that they've been infected with chikungunya and you know we also have the co-infections with other flaviviruses uh, the mosquito is the best way to get it there is also other vectors that you can get it uh, usually very rarely through maternal fetal transmission and very rarely to blood products and organ transplantations you can get the chikungunya. Um, but there's been a transmission of chikungunya via blood products back in France. Uh, there was a nurse that was infected by exposure to blood while she was caring for a patient. And I think that was the first case that we saw of possible blood, blood transmission. Um, Technically, it can also happen with organ transmission because, um, you know, if you have a very high viremia, at least 10 to 9, it's likely, um, you know, to be that organ affected and you can get it. Um, and there has been also chikungunya, uh, various infections in the human cornea, which can be transmitted if, you know, you do corneal grafts. And this has been documented in individuals, even if they don't have any manifestation systematic of chikungunya. Regarding the maternal fetal transmission, it says that, you know, pregnant women are not at increased risk for a typical or severe disease. We haven't found anything. Um, the maternal fetal transmission has been described, 
and there has been some association with miscarriage um, tends to be highest uh, during the intrapartum period two days before delivery to two days after and during this uh, period the vertical transmission actually happened in between half the cases of the cases that were diagnosed um, and they also found that c-section was actually not protective so Zika tends to affect more in the first trimester, chikungunya more in the third trimester. And chikungunya so far has not been detected in breast milk. So, and we haven't found any cases of breastfeeding just like um, Zika. Um, usually uh, acute infection tends to happen three to seven days. Usually it's fever and malaise. Um, they tend to have sometimes asymptomatic seroconversion in less than 15% of the patients. The most characteristic of this uh, chikungunya virus is the polyartralgia, which essentially is going to be bilateral and symmetric, and it's going to be such a severe pain that it's going to be disabling in some cases and it leads to immobilization. Some of the skin manifestation is again the maculopapular rash usually starts in the trunk, in the limbs, and can involve the face. Um, people can complain of severe itchiness, just like with Zika. And on physical exam, you can have some edema um, and peripheral lymphadenopathy. Conjunctivitis might be observed, but tends to be um, more associated with Zika. And of course, you can see the lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, and the hepatic transaminases. Usually it lasts the acute episode, seven to 10 days. And then you have the convalescent or the other one, which essentially can last for weeks, which is uh, only the severe atrocities. Diagnosis, again, for reverse transcriptase PCR. Usually uh, individuals that present one to seven days following this. The symptoms, you know, we can use the reverse transcriptase PCR for the, the, for the chikungunya and a negative test should tell us that we should do an ELISA or an indirect fluorescent antibody. Those that are already affected for more than eight days, you know, we should go directly with the ELISA and ANIFA. It should be performed. Um, the chikungunya virus RNA can be detected by PCR during the first five days with excellent sensitivity and specificity. And we also have the IgM which you know, can be present between around five days after you get infected. Um, IgG can be present up to two weeks after the onset of symptoms and can persist for years. And usually we can all culture this virus, but it's mostly for our research. There is no specific treatment. It's mostly supportive. We can do anti-inflammatory drugs. A lot of the people were using a lot of steroids and that tend to help with the severe arthralgias that the patient had. Um, when it's persistent or relapsed, sometimes they have had to use some of the DMARC agents because it's such a debilitating arthralgias that they have to um, recur to that. And in the post-acute disease, sometimes they have some sequela of the severe and debilitating arthralgias that sometimes, you know, they need to continue with medications for the neuropathic pain like gabapentin and physical therapy. Um, so. The two that we discussed that I didn't knew much of, and they said that given our ongoing Zika outbreak, um, some two that actually uses the same vectors are the Mayaro and the Usuto. Um, and even though so far there hasn't been any diagnosed cases here in the United States, um, mostly in South America, Recently, they have found them in the Caribbean and also in part of Central America. So they use the same vector, so that's something to keep in mind, especially because Zika is not new, and we just came to find out that it causes some neurological problems. So we don't know what these two viruses can, you know, maybe they can mutate and like something else can happen. So Mayaro is a mosquito, usually endemic to certain humid forests of tropical South America. The infection tends to be, again, nonspecific. It's an acute, self-limited, dengue-like illness. Um, it's in the family Togavirus of the genus Alpha virus, so it's essentially uh, very related to dengue. So far, we know that it tends to happen in South America. And like I said, it's fever, headaches, myalgia, rash. So 
if somebody presents with that, it's very non-specific. So you have a, like a gamma of different flaviviruses to choose from. Um, it can be confirmed by reverse transcripted PCR. Uh, you can also isolate this in cell culture if there is effective, uh, usually tends to be more effective during viremia. And you can also do IgM uh, to capture this. Usually the IgG is mostly for epidemiological studies more than anything. Um, human infections are associated with extreme exposure to humid tropical forest environments. So we have that in February of 2011, they reported that Mayaro virus was in the Amazonas state in Brazil, and they actually did the survey from 600 residents, and um, just like randomly, and 30 of them, 33 had the Mayaro virus. Four of the cases actually experienced mild hemorrhagic symptoms, and that was not expressed before associated with Mayaro. And uh, they also stated that this was detected in a metropolitan setting too, which might be concerning because you know they think that this might be adapting to urban settings of mosquito vectors, which makes it even more easier to spread around. And in 1991, we have that, you know, the Iris apopictus also is colonized with that, and that in October 2011, Iris aegypti can transmit the Mayaro virus. So two of the main vectors are the ones that we actually have also here in the United States. We had an outbreak in Bolivia back in 2007, and then we had that in January 2010, a French tourist develop a high grade, high grade fever after he went for a 15 days to the Amazon. So that was the first reported case, traveler uh, returning from South America back in Europe. Um, but it also has been reported um, in the United States by two visitors who actually went to Peru um, and uh, into the Netherlands by a couple infected while vacationing in Serena. The first outbreak of Mayaro happened in Venezuela, and that was in 2010. 69 cases were diagnosed, um, and you know they have like different, like 71 cases as of June 8 were reported in Venezuela. And uh, a virologist was saying that um, basically the symptoms induced by Mayaro in the New World tend to be a little bit more typical. Um, which supports the theory that the Mayaro virus is an old virus introduced to the new world via the slave trade. So even though this is not a new virus, some of the presentations might not be as typical as they did back in the days. And sadly, we have a case reported in a child in Haiti, and that's the Caribbean. So it seems like you know we have come to start having some spreading of the Mayaro virus. Treatment. There is no specific treatment as most of our flaviviruses mostly supportive, but they say that you know some of the studies that some macrophage migration inhibitory factor plays a role in determining the severity of alpha viruses musculoskeletal disease. So this can be something that they can target, including the chikungunya as well. And last, the usutu, which I had no idea what it was. Um, was first identified in South America, Africa in 1959. It's an emerging zoonotic virus, hypovirus, of concerns because of its pathogenicity to humans and similarity to other emerging arboviruses, including the West Nile. It's a flaviviruses, and it actually belongs to the Japanese encephalitis complex. Has been reported in several African countries, including Senegal, Central African Republic, Nigeria, Uganda, Morocco. So far, the only two human cases have been identified in Africa in 1981 and 2004, and one of them was described as being severe. Um, and the virus was first identified outside of Africa in 2001, which was diagnosed in Austria, where it caused significant mortality along the Old War Blackbirds in Virginia, in Vienna. So the first human case outside of Africa was reported in Italy back in 2009, and this was an immunocompromised patient, and he ended up having encephalitis. 
Um, this virus tends to like more the culex, more than the aedes and the uh, species. Um, also tends to like birds and humans. Um, the Ustuto, usually um, a mosquito species confirms the role of Culex pipiens as the main vector and recently we have found that it can also be transmitted using the Aedes albopictus in the virus cycle. So again, the same vector as the other flaviviruses that we discussed. So, any questions? So what I wanted to bring with this is um, these arboviruses are not new, have been present for a long time and uh, there's different um, topics of conversation whether there has been some mutation they even mentioned something about the genetically engineered mosquitoes back in Brazil that they were introduced because they were trying to reduce the dengue populate the dengue epidemic in Brazil and this created the ongoing Zika outbreak um, we still have a lot of unanswered questions and we still certainly still have some room for other uh, viruses that even though we're old at some point might create some ongoing sequela. We know that Zika has a lot of affinity for the nervous system, but we don't know what other viruses out there might have affinity for other organ systems. Um, we still have an ongoing research about possible treatment, possible vaccines, how to prevent any complications in the fetus. So that's still um, new to us. So if anybody has anything else to comment or add, please feel free to do so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much.